Hello everyone, with me here today I have Team 11260 Upper Creek Robotics from Colorado. They were the winning alliance first pick at the Houston World Championship this year and are looking to be captaining or on the winning alliance again at CRI today. We're going to hear about their robot and more now on First Updates Now. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many FIRST alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. Discover MSOE, where hands-on learning today can lead to real-world applications tomorrow, including their We Energy STEM Center, built to support FIRST teams. Head on over to msoe.edu slash visit to see a virtual tour and schedule your campus visit today. All right, Sam, before we talk about the specifics of your robot, let's talk about like the design process coming into the season. You know, you guys have built strong robots every year. I think a big part of that is having the initial idea. So what goes into that? How do you guys decide like what to do with your robot design? Yeah, so at the start of the season, um, we really tried to figure out what would be the best way to score the most points. And so when we were analyzing our game, um, we decided that the shared hub would be the most optimal for scoring the fastest amount of points. And this is because uh, the smaller distance between the warehouse and the shared hub would allow us to get faster cycle times and outweigh that um, four point uh, difference. And we would also be able to get that 20 point tip, which would really help us win matches at a very high level. Sure, and let, you know, let's talk about the turret intake. I mean, you guys just have so many degrees of freedom. How did you guys decide, like, was this like initial design? Like you were like, okay, we need a turret here. We need our intake to rotate here. We need extension on our slides. How did that come about? Yeah, absolutely. So when we were looking at the design of this robot, we wanted to make sure that everything would be as optimized as possible. And so when we were looking, we would first start with our drivetrain. And so we would figure out the distance we would need to drive back and forth between the warehouse and the shared hub. And so we would look at our drive speeds and how fast we would be able to drive there and then that would be like our baseline time for everything where all the other me mechanisms would need to happen so like we would have a, like a half a second for an intake time and then we would need to make sure that our turret could turn 90 degrees and our linear slide could get to the correct position in order to deposit in that amount of time that we were driving so that we could have the most optimal cycle times. Yeah, and you know, your robot's already up. Let's just talk about the drivetrain. I mean, there's a ton of different drivetrain designs we've seen this year. I think you guys have a very unique one. It's proven very effective. We see you guys have two different types of drive systems, transmission systems, and then also these belts that seem to run all the way across. Can you walk us through that, if it's changed throughout the season or if it's just been the same since day one? Yeah, absolutely. So um, at the start of the season, we looked at a lot of different types of drivetrains. And so we um, looked at different like suspension type systems, um, this belt drive, uh, we tried like slotted wheels and stuff like that, um, but we ended up going with this uh, thin mechanism system and so at the start of the season we had uh, thicker mechanism wheels um, which were a little bit harder to work with and made our belt system a bit more uh, thin and uh, less able to clear the bars uh, as we wanted them to. Um, and so right now uh, we have these thinner mechanism wheels and then we have a very thick belt system which allows us to ride on top of the bars when we go over. Um, and we also have our drive motors offset, so to our direct drive and then to our chain drive. And so that helps us uh, fit more space in here for our odometry system, um, which is able to be lifted off the ground via two servos on either side. And then so these are independently sprung. And then they're also using strings to be able to lift off the ground. Um, and then... Uh, we also have these bumpers at the front and back of the robot. And so that makes it so that when we hit the bars, um, when we don't want to go over them, instead of like driving up and getting stuck on possibly the triangles, we instead just bounce off and we can keep continuing on with our uh, driving. Awesome, yeah, I think that's an excellent overview of your drivetrain. Let's go on to your turret next. We have seen teams go with a lot of different designs for their turrets, uh, bearing stacks, worm gears, just you know, directly on the motor. How do you guys run your turret? How do you make it so consistent? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the turret mainly consists of this uh, big Lazy Susan bearing here, and then we have a nice cnc sprocket on top of that. And so this one is just like off of Amazon. It's like 10 or 20 bucks. Uh, so that, it's not the best quality bearing, but um, we were able to custom drill our own holes in order to mount it straight to our frame. And then the powertrain is with a motor that's using a plastic bevel gear here. So this fits right into our um, drivetrain. And then this bevel gear here transfers power to this bevel gear and then this sprocket to uh, the main turret system. And so this leaves us with a really smooth system um, that has been working very well. 
and keeps our drive motors low to the ground so we have a low center of mass. Yeah, and you know, about like tracking the position of your turret, I think that's another challenge teams may not think about or do think about it and have trouble doing it. How do you guys keep track of your turret position? Yeah, so we just use the uh, internal motor encoder on the rev encoder and then that will keep track of our degrees and so we're able to convert those ticks into the degrees of the turret um, and then that helps us keep our position. Awesome, yeah. Next, let's go on to your slide system, your extension system for your intake. It has two degrees of freedom. It both like rotates up and down and then extends in and out. How has this changed throughout the season and what is it now? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we knew that we wanted to have an extension on our slide uh, in order to reach into the far corners of the warehouse in order to deposit and to place on the far sides of the shared hub so that we could maximize the number of points we're scoring. And so this is basically the same, um, but it's changed a few w ways. So this used to be a horizontal link. Linkage, um, but now it's a vertical linkage and the slides uh, have increased from uh, 8 to 10 inches since the uh, Colorado State Championship and th so that really just helped us get to the very far corner of the shared hub which really helped us so that we could score the most points possible. Yeah, awesome and I think the last thing to talk about on your uh, robot hardware wise is your intake. You know, it's not just a standard intake. Yes, you have a box but again, it also pivots even though your arm has that pivot already. So what was the logic behind that? How has that helped you this season and is that something you would look to do again? Yeah, so um, the reason we had to make this pivot on a servo is because uh, with this variable arm and the extension, uh, this if you kept this at a fixed angle, this wouldn't be flat to the ground at uh, every intake position. And so this just gives us a lot more flexibility. So you can see as we go in and out, um, we can adjust our intake angle to have the most optimum pickups. And so this is run through a coaxial shaft. So we can see the intake motors here, but then it goes down and then drives through this central shaft which has the intake tilt and then runs to the other side so that it can drive the actual intake shaft. Sure, and, and so, how has your yeah. intake changed throughout the season? Have you guys just used like the same noodle, the same tubing, the same box, everything, all the way from day one, or has it progressed? Yeah, so we went through a lot of different prototypes of different kinds of brushes, and so uh, these are probably our third different kind of brushes. So we obviously played in Rover Ruckus, so we had a pretty decent idea of what we would need in order to intake freight. Um, but we ended up taking a few different iterations because of the heavier blocks. Um, it's significantly harder to intake those than the lighter freight. And so we did have to end up going with a bit of a stiffer option. And even this intake isn't perfect. Yeah, and I think personally the last thing that I'm most interested uh, in with your robot is it seems like you guys are using just a ton of different types of materials. I mean, I see just like normal 3D printed parts, maybe some carbon fiber, nylon, uh, aluminum, maybe wood, just a ton of different things. Can you walk me through like how you guys decide which material to use where or if it's sort of just like gut intuition, what's going on there? Yeah, so the whole idea behind this robot was to be as light and fast as possible. And so this robot with the battery weighs only 22 pounds. And so we really just went to m minimize the weight on this. So uh, in a lot of different places, we use uh, 3D printed parts. And then, um, so that's just for like complexity and stuff. So like this part here is extremely com complicated. And so you need something like a 3D printer to make that. But then like for these big side plates, like aluminum is a very strong choice. And then you can see we've pocketed that to keep the weight down. Same with our uh, turret gear. And then even the Lazy Susan, we drilled a bunch of those holes in there just so that we could re reduce the weight even more. And then uh, this wood here is really stiff option to keep it lightweight and um, it works great and then for like these applications like these gears or uh, our linkage here we uh, have access to a mark forge carbon fiber 3d printer from our frc team and so that's been really helpful in order to really keep this uh, rigid structure that's never going to break and so since we've installed this uh, carbon fiber parts we've never had one break um, and it's a really good alternative for aluminum. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I mean, I think just the whole hardware on your robot is definitely top tier. I mean, we've seen how you guys have performed this year. I think like a lot of other top teams, one thing that makes you so good is not just your hardware, but your software as well. So I think we should dive into that a little bit. Uh, Rishi, I guess my first question to you is, how do you keep track of yourself in autonomous? I mean, we saw that you have odometry pods. Are you guys using Roadrunner or your own library or just something entirely different? What's going on there? Yeah, so you saw our dometry pods earlier. Um, there's almost like, there's no, there's almost little to none friction on them. Um, and so we're really able to track our position very accurately. Um, and so what we use is a custom peer pursuit. And um, we're just tracking our position as we run our auto pass. And then after a bunch of tuning, we can just get it as consistent as possible. Um, yeah, I think one of our main focuses when making autos is to make them as consistent as possible. Like, 
Um, if you've watched our autos, if we hit the bars um, in our auto, we can recorrect ourselves and keep intaking. Yeah, um, there's definitely. Al there's almost like no situation what the robot is in where it can, unless it like tips over, where the robot can't fix itself and start getting more freight. Sure. And then, you know, you guys mentioned you use a custom Pure Pursuit library. So is that something you guys developed like during the season while you were building this robot? Is this something you started after the robot was built? Like how did you manage those timelines? Yeah, so our custom Pure Pursuit algorithm was developed um, in the off season of Rover Ruckus. So after Rover Ruckus, um, yeah, we developed it in that off season and we used it for Sky Stone and we've been slowly getting better at tuning it, making it better. Um, and making our autos as consistent as possible. Um, that's just been our main focus for sure. those three years. And then what about your angle? Do you guys, you guys only have two odometry wheels, so do you use something else to keep track of your angle, or how do yeah. you do that? Yeah, so we just use the IMU in the, um, uh, in the hubs, and, um, but if you've watched our autos, you see that we really like to keep a static heading during our routes. Um, we just strafe the Alliance hub, and then we strafe back and then to intake freight. Um, we think it's the easiest way, and we also think that turning in autos is a little bit harder um, it can usually re result in a loss of position. So keeping a static heading has worked out really well for us. Yeah, awesome. And I think one of the most impressive uh, software aspects of your robot is your teleop automations and specifically your teleop auto drive. So let's go head down to the field and take a look at how all of that works. Sounds good. So Rishi, something I feel like teams always try for every year is trying to automate their teleop as much as possible. From my understanding, you guys have really taken this to a super far extent. Do you want to talk about your teleop auto drive features? Yeah, of course. So um, the first thing we do after we end autonomous is we have a color sensor under our, our light sensor under our robot, and so we can sense when we pass over the white line. And um, when we do that, we reset our position to wherever the white line is. So now that we know that we where we are in teleop, we can use um, we can use path following algorithms to go to the shared hub. So as soon as Sam picks up a block, it'll immediately turn the turret to the deposit position, and then if he holds backwards, it'll automatically drive. And you can see it stopped exactly where we need to in order to deposit on the shared hub. And then, and then as soon as he deposits, the turret turns back to zero and goes right back to intaking. So Sam, all Sam has to do is go backwards and forwards, and he, ha he can't go too far too short because the robot will automatically drive to where we need to go. And then when I'm controlling, what I can do is I can choose the delivery positions and I can make it drive an inch farther, an inch shorter um, each time. So if at a certain point we're delivering short, we're delivering too far, I can just press a button and it'll go an inch short or an inch too far. And I can do the same thing with the slide, the lift, and the turret. And then it'll just remember that position and go back there the next time. Um, yeah, so like, is this something you guys use just like on occasion, or is this something that's just used every single match, every single time? Yeah, whenever we're doing shared hub, we're auto driving. Everything's automated. That's awesome. And how like how long does it take to develop something like this? Like, was this like a one and done type thing, or did you spend a lot of time iterating the code, working and you know working out bugs, making sure everything was perfect? Yeah, the auto drive itself um, actually took a lot of time, just because the robot when it accelerates, it didn't accelerate in a straight line. So we actually have biases in the auto drive to turn and straight towards the wall because um, for the blue it was fine but for the red it would it would um, turn outwards away from the wall so when we wanted to accelerate forward it would just hit the bars so we have certain precautions in place so that it's constantly pressed against the wall as it auto drives the shared home yeah I mean that's awesome I think this is something that every team with really great software aims to achieve and you guys have definitely made it a reality this year thank you that demo was absolutely incredible. I think teams can really learn a lot there. Before we head out, uh, I think one last thing that I want to ask you guys about is what's the plan at CRI? Are you guys going to run that new co-op uh, hub? Are you guys going to continue what you're doing on shared or switch to Alliance? What's the move? Um, it honestly depends on what our teammates can do. If our teammates have a really good Alliance auto, um, by good I mean like one plus four, one plus five, then it's worth it for us to run our co-op auto because we found that our co-op auto and our normal auto get around the same amount of points because we don't preload in our co-op auto. Um, so it kind of depends because we like to end in the warehouse because then we can just transition right into shared, um, but our co-op auto doesn't do that. So it really depends on our teammates, but I really think our co-op auto can get a lot of points when paired with the right teammate. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Upper Creek. I mean, it's just really been a pleasure to hear about your robot, how you guys make it so good and consistent. That's all for me for now. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm a boss. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Discover MSOE, where hands-on learning today can lead to real-world applications tomorrow, including their We Energy STEM Center built to support FIRST teams. Head on over to msoe.edu visit to see a virtual tour and schedule your campus visit today.
If you are a college student or recent graduate looking for an incredible internship, take a look at Stryker. Stryker provides a housing stipend, great pay, and an opportunity to work with state-of-the-art medical technology equipment. Discover why so many FIRST alumni are coming to Stryker for their internship or career at careers.stryker.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.